Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have kind of part four with Michael Park. Uh, Michael Park is a good friend. I was able to hunt with him in 1996, I believe, the first year we met. And uh, in 2009, uh, Michael has killed 50 elk with his bow. He's 48 years old. That's quite a feat. Uh, Michael, how you doing? Pretty good, Jay. How you doing today? Good. Um, did we meet in 96 or was it 97? 97. Okay, 97. I think in the last episode I said 96 as well. Um, you had a tag in 97 uh, and I met you on the side of the road. I think I was underneath a, a uh, jacked up truck of, of, of mine that the brakes had gone out. It was about a thousand dollar truck that I had at the time. Yeah. Was, and, was, it a, uh, was it a two-tone brown Ford Ranger or was it a, just brown? Well, it, well, it was brown because it was dirty, but the original color was blue, but I don't think I ever washed that <laughs> truck one time. And, um, you know, knowing me, all it needed was some brake fluid, but for, for whatever I remember, I was underneath that thing, and you and Casey came pulling up, and you had a tag there in Unit 3C, and got to tag around with you guys, and had a great time, and you, I credit you guys with teaching me a lot about elk hunting right from the get-go, and um, it's it's been fun chasing those buggers ever since. Uh, we've had some great talks here. I've talked to you three episodes in a row on bow setup and finding bulls on and hunting bulls on public land. Uh, and calling elk and your strategy and calling. I want to talk uh, today on kind of sh- is, is shooting 50 elk with a bow. You've seen every good shot, bad shot. You've seen good shots gone bad. You've seen bad shots gone good. You've probably seen some crazy things that have actually killed elk. Um, and I want to talk to you about shot execution, uh, under pressure, uh, things that you found that help you, um, and I want to talk about some shot angles uh, and kind of dive into all of that. So um, let's have some fun today, okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. First and foremost, um, are there are there certain things that that help you execute a great shot under pressure that you've learned, and if so, what are they? Um, this is kind of how I have a approach it i mean i get buck fever target panic you name it um all of the above so i approach it and this is probably a little different than a lot of guys would would approach it um i look at everything i'm going to shoot as if it owes me money and i've come to collect (laughs) i love it did that (laughs) have you always my mindset you know have you always been like that no i mean this is the last five or six years I struggled through a pretty bad bout of shooting in 2008 um actually I was on a deer hunt in southern Oregon and in eight days I missed five blacktail bucks all of them inside of 30 yards just total mind meltdowns um came home got rid of all my equipment started fresh and uh kind of approached it from that point on that I'm shooting at stuff like okay you owe me money and I've come to collect I love that. I love that. So, so in other words, you're shoot. You're there. You mean business. I, I, you're not I, fiddle I, farting around. No. You're, you mean you when you go to shoot, you shoot to kill. Absolutely. Okay. So from the point that say a bull elk steps out, um, what you know, what's going through your mind, and how do you slow everything down and make it happen? If I, you know, I've gotten to full draw and he's in my wheelhouse where I like him, you know, he's in that 25 to 35 yard range and he's broadside or a touch quartered away. I don't like him real quartered away, but, you know, it's a really nice shot. I, you know, it's, it's a, what I consider a good clean killing shot. I mean, it's just like, okay, I've come to collect my debt, um, mental checklist in my mind, string on the tip of my nose, pin in the peep. Pull through the shot. Pull through this shot. Don't mess this up, dipstick. You got it. <laughs> pull through this shot, and it's over with. And uh, you know, if the bow goes off properly, they're usually dead. Okay. And automatically, the shot goes off. What do you do? Um, I'm usually trying to bugle as fast as I can to slow a bull down. 
so a lot of times, you know, they'll go 40, 50, 60 yards and stop, and sometimes less, and, uh, you know, just trying to slow him down. He doesn't really know what's bit him. Um, you know, he thinks maybe a bull's hooked him or something like that. And they usually won't just run for miles right away. I mean, they'll go away and they'll stop. And if you can get them calmed right back down, they're shot good, you're going to watch them die. I mean, I've, you know, over 50% of my watch tip over. Okay, so you shoot them, you bugle to try and slow them up. Are you also knocking another arrow? Absolutely. I'll turn them into General Custer if I can. <laughs> at that point, I look at it as if he shot good, I might as well uh, practice on a live elk. <laughs> so you're saying if you can see him and if they're still standing, you're shooting. If it's a clear shot, you bet. And at that point, you know you've hit him and you still see elk hide. At that point, are you as picky about where you shoot him or are you just filling him up? Filling him up. Okay. Um, and if they're in sight and you're watching them go down, are you moving a lot or are you stationary? What are you doing? No, if I shoot a bull, I'll just freeze you know, freeze in that spot, you know, because they can see pretty good. I mean, so, you know, I'll freeze, they'll usually bolt, um, and get right on the bugle and just stop movement. Just watch, watch and listen. I don't hear well, but you know, I still try and listen. And are you kind of looking with your binos if they kind of are in the brush and you're trying to, I mean, are you trying to figure out how hurt they are? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if it's in the real brush, you know, go right to my 10 powers and, you know, that helps it helps the vision really well. I'm trying to see where the arrow is in it if they're in brush and you can't shoot again. I mean, basically, I'll just set my bow down and watch um, to see what they're doing and, you know, try and go from there. But, you know, I'll just sit. Okay, and if if they go out of sight and you think they're hit good, how long do you wait before you go after them? Um, I like to try and give them an hour. Even if you know you think you've center punched them? If, yeah, if, if I don't hear them crash or don't see them crash, I'm going to give them some time. Because once you bump them, they become Superman. Once they get their adrenaline going, man, um, I've seen some really wild stuff happen. And, you know, if you can get them into the first bed and keep them in their first bed, if you know, if, if say they're a one long liver hit type of a deal, you're better off doing that than getting right on them and bumping them. So the only ones I'll just get up but fairly quick and get on is if I've heard them pile up or um, seen them pile up. Okay. Let's say... You've seen some bad shots uh, in your time. Let's say you know it's 100% a gut shot. What do you do? And and they go out of sight. What do you do? Flag where I was at. If I think they've went a little ways, try and flag where the bull was standing at and get out. How long? 24 hours. Okay, so... You're going to flag your position. You're going to, if you know that you can get to where the bull is standing and not booger the bull, you're going to flag that spot and then you're going to give it 24 hours if you know it's a gut shot. Yep. What has been your experience if you do give them, you know, 24 hours, what has been your experience on success of them being dead in that first bed or, or you know, close to it? Um. Quite a few times you find them in the first bed or the second bed within 200 yards. And we all know that if you jump a bull that's gut shot more times than not, you never find them again. Nope. In talking and with, th- with other people, that have, you know, I'll talk to as many people about as many things as I can and try and go into the detail. Well, I, you know, when somebody tells me oh, I hit bad hit, but I found him, you know, X amount of time later, and, you know, I want to know the story how – he, get, he went his mile, and usually it's somebody going in too soon and bumping them once, and, you know, and five days later they find them with the ravens and the buzzards, and they're three-quarters of a mile, a mile away, and, you know, of course they're not bleeding at all. They don't bleed very well from gut shots in my experience. So, um, you know, if I think they're shot through the guts, I'm going to give them a lot of time. Okay, and, and 
a lot of times it's going to take them quite a while to die. With that 24-hour scenario, you still potentially have a have a great opportunity to get that bull and and re- reclaim all the meat and, and get the meat as well. The 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 trade-off, and it's always so hard, is people feel like, well, I'm going to lose the meat. Well, the reality is he may lay there and not die for 16 or 18 hours, and you come bebopping along, or 20 hours, and you come bebopping along, you know, and overnight, and all of a sudden he's there, and you can recover the meat. Um, right. But, but also, there's also the thought of, are you better off if you've shot that elk and you've wounded that elk and you've shot him in the guts? I would rather find the rack and not get the meat than go harvest another bull. I mean, we've all been in the same situation, but more than likely that elk you just shot in the guts is dead. Right. You know, that, so that's at least my elk. It, I'm going to try and find him. I'm going to do right. everything I can to find him. and I'm going to punch my ticket when I find him. Right, exactly. Okay. I was just curious your thought on that. I mean, the last uh, last one I got shot, uh, I think it was 2013 in Oregon. I mean, just, and this is a prime example how long they can live, and that's why I'm bringing this up. Um, I mean, I totally botched the shot at 18 yards. I don't know if I didn't get into my bow right, torque my bow, what I did. I mean, I, bad shot, gut shot. Knew it was gut shot as soon as the arrow hit him. Um, watched the bull, he run out in, he probably ran 80 yards and stopped. He stood there and I had no, sh- you know, no way to shoot at him again. I could, you know, I was watching him through my glasses. He stood there for two hours. He worked and then he started working down a drainage. I knew the drainage I was in. The north, north side had timber in it. The south slope was burned off, you know, wide open stuff. And the timber, just the farther you went down the creek, the timber, neck down and neck down and neck down so i just snuck out um came back that night and sat on a high point and glassed um couldn't glass him up in the timber at all you know it was kind of open timber i was hoping to put eyes on him come back the next morning to start working this patch of timber out and you know he was of course not bleeding at all um started down a ridge to get the wind right to work into this patch of trees and uh, lo and behold he was standing in a saddle 24 hours later alive um, and shot him again, killed him. Wow, 24 hours later. Was your arrow still in him, or did it have blown right through him? It had, it had blown right through him. Gotcha. Wow, that's an incredible story. Pe- yeah, I think a, a lot of people don't have any idea how long they can actually, um, you know, they're tough. Those animals are very, very tough animals. Yeah, it, um, if you bump them and get the adrenaline going, usually it's, See you later. You're never going to see him again. Okay. In the scenario that you shoot them, uh, you think you hit them good, but they go out of sight. You hear some crashing a little bit, and um, you give them an hour. And then you, what do you do? Do you go to where they were standing? Um, I usually go to where they were standing when I shot them. Start looking for my arrow. Start looking for blood. And you know if there's a blood trail there, which hopefully there is, you know, just start down it really quiet. When you find the arrow, what do you do when you find the arrow? Um, check it for sign, you know, look at the blood on it, look to see if there's bubbles, see if it's dark blood from a liver hit, see if there's green stuff on it from a gut hit. Just kind of try and see if it's going to give you any indication of what you've hit and uh, go from there. For the listeners listening that are, are kind of new to it, if you see bubbles, what specifically, what does a, a, a lung shot bull look, uh, arrow look like? It should have small bubbles on the shaft, um, you know, the size of the pinhead type of dried bubbles on it from the blood. Okay, and is it possible to have bubbles if you hit them uh, anywhere other than the lungs? I've seen it on liver hit bulls. Okay. So I, and you know, is, I don't totally that's buy the, blood co- the, the, the bubble theory, but, you know, a lot of people do. Okay. And a double lung hit, you found the arrow, there's bubbles on the arrow, you didn't see the bull go down, um, maybe went over a ridge or something out of sight. How quickly should someone be seeing blood if it's a double lung hit? Um, boy, that varies with 
where he's hitting the lungs, if he's hit high or low, if you went in through a rib or if you went in between the ribs, how tight to the shoulder you were. I've seen no blood in 100 yards. I've seen paint trails for 100 yards. I mean, I've kind of seen everything. I mean, you can't just, oh, there's no blood. I didn't hit him well. Um, hit him a little high through the lungs and they don't bleed very much out. out explain, explain that. Why, if you hit them high in the lungs, do they not bleed out? Most of the blood stays in the chest cavity is my thoughts. I also think when you hit ribs, um, you know, the arrow doesn't make, the broadhead doesn't make as big a hole for the blood to flow out of as it hits between the ribs and kind of spreads the hide in the muscle more. So, you know, just because there's not a lot of blood, if you think you've made a good shot, just because there's not blood all over the ground, you know, proceed with caution, but he's probably toast. And when you say you get on the trail and you go slow, how slow and what are you exactly looking for? I'm looking for blood. I'm looking for tracks, uh, you know, pattern of travel. Um, found a lot of them that, you know, okay, he's kind of lined out this way. And if they're shot good, they're running dead on their feet. And they don't do a bunch of zigzagging around, say, if they're hitting the guts in one liver and they, you know, start doing tricky stuff. But if they're shot through the heart or the lungs, they usually, a lot of times, will just, you know, they're dead on their feet running. And a lot of times they'll go in a straight line. Okay. One question I have, elk standing at 20 yards, he's broadside, and you take from the top of his back to the bottom of his uh, belly. Um, when when you're just drawn back and you're going to put that arrow in the perfect spot, is it dead center, top to bottom? Is it lower third? Is it upper third? Where are Where's your number one go-to spot? Very top of the upper the bottom third okay so split it split it into thirds yep. and the very top of the upper third the bottom the bottom bottom third, not third. the upper the upper we're going to shoot over his back okay so basically split it split it in the middle and then drop down a smidge from there is what you're saying yep okay and in relation to the shoulder on a broadside elk that's leg is just straight down it's not forward it's not back how close to the crease of that shoulder do you want to shoot him i want to shoot him right almost up the center of the leg okay just so i hear you correctly are you shooting in that shoulder blade crease or are you shooting forward of that crease should be just behind it i mean the shoulder blade sits a little bit to the front of the leg i feel and higher, so I should basically come in between where the the bottom leg bone hits the top leg bone, which goes into the shoulder blade, and there's kind of, a, I think, a little bit of a V in there, and that's where I should hit him, right on the okay. back part of the, meat, the meaty part of the shoulder. Okay, so in essence, if you can just, perfect shot is if you can barely, you know, just barely miss that, that part of that scapula, that shoulder blade right there in the crease, you you have from there to if you said perfection from that point back what about six inches that's just primo yeah for sure okay okay and then let's talk about um, the leg being forward and the leg being back what have you seen with that scenario and why is it important um, the leg being forward opens him up a little bit more um, it gets the shoulder a little more out of your way um, you're you know it probably, if the legs forward opens it up another four to six inches, it moves the shoulder forward, so it just gives you a bigger area to hit. Whereas when the legs back, it pulls that shoulder back over the vital thumb, and uh, you know it just becomes a train wreck if they're hitting the shoulder blade. How close have you shot them, or do you think they can be shot right through the shoulder, right through that shoulder blade, and still die? How close do you have to be? Um, I've only had that happen once, and that bull was shot at about 33 yards. And it went, you know, I've got the shoulder blade out in my shop, and it's got a perfect triangle through it. I don't know what freaks of nature worked that day to get the arrow through there, but I mean, he went 60 yards and died. Okay. 
One thing for people listening, though, you do want to watch when that leg is back, correct? I mean, because yep. it just shrinks up your window of, of opportunity. Yeah, I, there. I think when the leg is back, it takes away 30% of your kill zone. Okay. Um, let's talk about a bull that's coming into the call, and a lot of times they come head on. Uh, is there a distance in which you will shoot them dead head on, and what is that distance and closer? What is that range that you would do it, if, um, or would you not? I've done it three times. All three times have been successful. All three times were under 20 yards. It It's absolutely devastating. Where does the arrow go? Um, it's usually in the back hand somewhere. It usually disappears. Okay, and specifically when they're coming head on and inside of 20 yards, where do you hold your pin? Uh, I hold it about, if you were to look at them head on, about where the mane kind of meets the chest, just a little bit up into the mane. Guys, I want to thank GoHunt.com Insider for their sponsorship, the title sponsorship of this podcast. I want to remind you that GoHunt.com Insider is doing a 30-day free trial exclusive for the J. Scott Podcast listeners. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J. Scott and click on the blue free trial button and go through the steps. It only takes a couple minutes. You will be required to provide a credit card, but you will not be charged until after the free 30 days. You can cancel at any time within the first 30 days to prevent being charged. If you have any questions at all, you can email freetrial at gohunt.com and someone from GoHunt team will promptly respond. Uh, this is the, the your chance to go check out the most innovative and cutting edge uh, hunt finding technology with the filtering 2.0 system. I want to thank GoHunt.com for their sponsorship of this podcast. I'd also like to thank the following sponsors of the podcast. Phonescope.com makes custom molded, uh, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Get yours now uh, by using the JSCOT16, all one word, JSCOT16 promo code and receive a 10% discount on all purchases. The Outdoorsman's is the hunting uh, optics authority and leading manufacturer of high-quality tripods and mounting accessories. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call them at 1-800-291-8065. If you use the J. Scott promo code, all one word, J. Scott promo code, you'll get a 10% uh, discount on all products. Wilderness Athlete is a nutrition and sports performance product company. Uh, that you can check out at wildernessathlete.com. Use the J. Scott promo code. That's all one word, J. Scott promo code, to receive 10% off any order. Utah Hydrographics can dip almost anything into a wide range of camel patterns, including the Kuyu Verde pattern. Give them a call and see what they can do for you. Receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16. That's J. Scott 16, all one word, promo code. Visit them at utahydrographics.com. Also, Western Hunter Magazine has a new promotion that they will send you for free uh, the latest fall issue of uh, Elk Hunter Magazine, uh, totally free, delivered to your door. If you go to westernhunter.net and subscribe, and when you get a chance to plug in the discount code, the promo code J Scott, all one word. Uh, they will also send you that free fall 2016 issue, and it will be on its way. I want to thank those sponsors. I want to also thank you guys, the listeners, uh, and let's get right back to this episode. Okay, and your thought there is you're hitting windpipe, you're you're blowing through that area and being able to hit the lungs, potentially heart, and, you know, cutting off their breathing right yeah, there? Yeah, you, you usually get, you know windpipe across the top of the heart down the center of the lungs through the liver through the guts and honestly they're probably usually running on a broadhead in their ham at that point too it's just have you ever seen that situation where they're coming hard and you can shoot them like that and then you get a second shot because you've shot them and they have no idea what's going on no i've never seen that um usually they've been you know spun and gone so fast that you know i can't see them but you know you hear them pile up or um, I want to say what that, was the blood like uh, in those three instances where you did that? Uh, crime scene. 
blood everywhere. Blood everywhere, and usually two of the three, I know when they spun to leave, you could see the blood spraying like a hose. I mean, it's just devastating. Okay. What about the shot that right below the spine in no man's land that we've all seen and we've all heard about where it's right underneath the spine and in that fatty area where there's just nothing? Um, um, what, do you, what do you know about that? I think it's a farce. Um, and my, to prove my point, I shot a buck deer, and it's been 20 years ago. Hit him in the spine and dropped him. And when I went to gut him out, um, pulled his lungs out, and across the top of both of his lungs, there was a crease from the blade that was sticking down. I think most of those shots that people think they hit the blade, they've actually backstrapped them. And when you mean backstrap, you mean... You're above the spine. Not above the spine, okay. So not a vital shot at all. Not a vital shot at all. It's you're to take one and you're doing it in the gutless method and you take the shoulder off, you take the back strap out and you look how far those dorsal vertebrae is right up from the shoulder. That stuff's sticking up there eight, eight inches in a lot of spots. So I think a lot of guys think they've shot them through the void and you know, you're going across the top of the lungs or I believe there's some big arteries that run right underneath the spine there too, that you should wipe out. And I know talking to vet, They've said the same thing. You know, the chest should basically be full of lungs. So I, what I think people are seeing there is honestly a backstrap shot that, you know, all you've done is educated the elk. Non-lethal. Have, have you seen backstrap elk rutting the next day? Yep. I've seen shoulder okay. shot elk rutting the next day. I've seen arrows bounced off their hip bones and their hams rutting the next day. Have you ever seen a ham shot and a bull die within sight? No. You've never seen the femoral artery hit and crime scene blood? No, I've never been around many of them shot in the butt. And the few I have, um, I can remember one that was hit kind of through the ham, came out of his ham, went into his balls, came out of his balls and went into his guts. And he didn't want to go anywhere. Laid up? Yeah. Okay, that's that's pretty good stuff. Is there anything else with shot placement? Um, what about elk moving? What's your thoughts on that when when you're about to shoot? No way. I don't care if they're even close. I, you know, it's just not a good thing. Um, one step, even at you know, fifteen twenty yards, takes you from a good shot to a bad shot. And I just it's something I avoid at all costs. Uh, fixed blade or mechanical? Fixed. If your state allowed mechanical, would you shoot mechanical? For deer. What's the difference? Uh, smaller, lighter animal. The brush I hunt in is just atrocious for deer, um, and I want you know as much blood as I can get. So a bigger animal, a big a elk is bigger. Still not going to use a mechanical. I, I don't think so. I, I don't have any experience. I know a lot of guys use them and have great success with them. But, um, you know, if I use what works for me, you know, why change it if it's not broken? Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, there's Everybody has their own distance that they feel comfortable with. With the new technology these days and bows and arrows and and uh, everything, do you think that there's, regardless of someone's skill level, do you still think there's a distance that people should not shoot past? Um, I mean, any time you get beyond 40 yards, you know, anything can go wrong. Yeah, I mean, a lot of guys can shoot good at 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 yards and shoot phenomenal groups. I mean, I'm a, I can shoot pretty good out at 70 yards, but um, I mean, that's the stuff I shoot, shoot far to make it easier when I'm close to stuff. Um, but I, I like stuff close. I mean, there's less chance for stuff to go wrong up close than it takes a long time for an arrow to travel 60 yards versus one that travels 25. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Um, okay. When you break down an elk, 
Are you gutting them or are you doing the gutless method? Gutless. I don't How know. long have you been doing that? Uh, since about 1992 or three. How fast can you break one down yourself from start to finish? By, gutless m- method? by myself, I'm done in about 90 minutes. 90 minutes and off and rolling? Yep. What do you think... Um, one thing that people is there a mistake that people make in the gutless method um or are there things that you've learned that have helped you in that gutless method uh boy i don't know i mean i just stick the knife in behind the horns go down the dorsal and down the back leg and down the shoulder and peel him down and start taking him apart making him smaller (laughs) sounds pretty simple when you say it like that it really is i mean a lot of guys get spun up but i mean if you go to youtube i mean you know i've just discovered youtube in the last year and that's that's a wonderful place you can figure out how to do anything on youtube yeah i've actually got some videos on the gutless method um on my youtube channel and i know i get a lot of feedback and emails from people saying how much it's helped them and certainly the gutless method um uh is is the way to go for sure um, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of times I'm by myself. Um, so I want that elk to be as small as possible, and it, that'll come right down to once I have him knocked apart and, you know, off the ground. You know, the way I figure it, if he's in the shade, I've got at least a day to work with him, you know, if it's normal September weather before, you know, he has to be in a cooler, and I'll, uh, you know, start packing him out. And if I'm by myself and if it's much of a pack, I'll even go so far as taking the femur out of the hams and, bone in the front shoulders out too i mean i just if i don't have to i'm not packing bones i don't eat them so you know let the coyotes and the birds and all that stuff have a treat what do you do when you uh do go boneless method and you start you know cutting all the meat off and you you're by yourself and you've got to make some trips um what specifically do you do with the meat um you know i try and carry a piece of plastic in my pack so I don't get it dirty as I'm taking it apart and lay it out. Um, If I'm going to bone it all out, the front shoulders in my world get turned into hamburgers, so, you know, it doesn't have to look beautiful. I just get them cleaned off and into a bag, and then the hams, it's really easy to take the femur out and separate that and uh, get them up off the ground so Eric can get around them and cool them out and, you know, start taking them out as much of the time as I can carry. That's when the work starts. Yep. That's when you get knees like what we've got, and you you wish you were twenty years old again, don't you? Oh, that'd be that'd be wonderful to be twenty years old again. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, we've had a great conversation. Uh, it's been a great four part series with you, and I really appreciate you spending time. Um, you got any finishing or final thoughts uh, before we? Uh, depart here today? Um, They're just elk. For all the new guys that have hunted deer, especially coming, you know, from the east at all, they're just elk. They're a bigger deer. You know, you shoot them through the lungs, they die. They're not iron. They're not, you know, indestructible. You shoot them right and they're dead. Yeah, and I really like the analogy of uh, you're you're going to collect your money. Uh, They owe you money and you're going to collect. I like that. Uh, Time to pay the bills. (laughs) Time to pay the bills. Uh, great stuff, Michael Park. Uh, I look forward to seeing the pictures of number 51 this year and, uh, look forward to you drawing a, another AZ tag one of these days so we can hang out. And, um, I know the listeners are going to get a lot from this, uh, uh, all your years of experience and, um, just congratulate you on that success that you've had. And, uh, yeah, it's been fun. Yes, it has. Hopefully you get a, you know, an email from some new guy from the east or somewhere, or even from the west that, hey, you know, I, I picked up a tip and I killed my first elk, and hopefully somehow, some way, we help somebody out today. That's awesome, buddy. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, have fun shooting the 3D, and uh, I'll be chatting at you, okay? Thanks for having me on, and good luck on your beaver hunt, man. All right, buddy. Talk to you. Guys, I want to thank you for listening to this four-part series with Michael Park. Uh, He's been a great friend and a lot of fun to hunt with, and I've learned a lot from him. And I hope you guys got a lot out of this uh, four-part series with him. And I want to thank you guys for your uh, 
all your support with this podcast. I want to uh, thank you for all the emails at, that I get at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com uh, with all the positive comments and all the great things uh, that you guys have to say and, and even some constructive criticism. So I really appreciate the feedback. Uh, I, I, I live on that feedback and I try and make this podcast better. Uh, by using that feedback. So please, if you haven't, send me an email. I'd like to hear from you. Uh, also, guys, you can follow along um, all, all of the adventures this fall through my website, jscottoutdoors.com. Uh, on that website, you can get link outs to my YouTube channel, J. Scott Outdoors, uh, my Instagram, at J. Scott Outdoors, my Facebook page, both personal, J. Scott, and business, the J. Scott Outdoors page. Um, and uh, just go to jscottoutdoors.com. That's going to be the central hub of the podcast and all the social media channels. And I uh, just appreciate all the support. I'd also like to ask you to go on iTunes and give me a five-star rating and uh, leave positive comments. That helps our placement uh, on iTunes. And it's fun uh, every week to see uh, where uh, the J. Scott Outdoors uh, podcast sits uh, compared to a lot of the other outdoor and recreation podcasts. So uh, that helps our placement. Please do that for us on iTunes. And until the next episode, guys, God bless.